Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers, and surprise, you are getting a second Voices episode this month. So our Voices series is usually where Megan and I take turns talking to someone, you know, besides each other, and often that is in the form of an interview. But I'm really excited today because I have with me two guest co-hosts from our contributor team. So I am here with Joanna Martin. Hi, Joanna. Hi. Hi. And Catherine DeVries. Hey, Catherine. Hi. So I'm so excited to have you both here. Thanks for joining me today. Kind of in like guest co-host chairs. You can imagine us around a table with some coffee, maybe. So Joanna and Catherine, listeners have already heard your voices in a couple of our past podcast episodes, a week of real life dinners. And then Catherine was part of our pandemic baby series. And then listeners, if you are on Instagram, you might have gotten to know Catherine and Joanna because we've been doing some day in the life Instagram takeovers that have been really fun. And both Joanna and Catherine have done those. So today we are actually talking about books and reading and both what we are reading as moms and adults and also the books that our kids are loving lately. So ladies, you are both big book lovers and readers, and I am someone who identifies as a reader but isn't necessarily always reading a ton. It depends on the season of life, but this is going to be really fun. Okay, so for those who don't know you both, let's go ahead and have you introduce yourselves. Maybe share a little bit about where you live and how old your kids are and a little bit about your background, especially as it relates to being a book lover and a reader. So Catherine, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, I am originally from Chicago. I live in Southern California now, and I have three kids. Uh, My oldest is five. I have a three-year-old. And then um, the baby actually just turned one today. Oh, Um, happy birthday. Yeah. And yeah, I grew up, I always loved to read. Um, My mom used to read to us a lot. She was a big, like, picture book collector, um, like I am. And then I studied English in college and kind of with a side of creative writing, And then I taught middle school English for 10 years. So I had a lot of opportunities to read um, really great young adult and middle grade books. I love that. And Joanna, how about you? Um, I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas, and I still currently live here. Um, I have three kids, a fresh eight-year-old. She just turned eight last week, um, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And I was actually a really reluctant reader (laughs) as a kid. Um, which was very dismaying to my teacher mom. Um, <laughs> she was very confused because my sister was a huge reader, but my first grade teacher actually recommended and um, sent me home with a hooked on phonics set. Okay. And I remember sitting down and doing those cassette tapes with my mom. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it's 
totally changed now. Um, I'm definitely a reader. I'm in two book clubs um, and I used to teach third grade and I used to teach in a preschool as well. And I just love children's literature. I love that. And I love hearing that story because I know we have uh, moms listening who have reluctant readers. And that's always, of course, when you're a reader yourself, that's kind of the fear of like, oh my gosh, I need my kids to love reading in the same way I do. And I think it can be hard to have to be raising reluctant readers. So that is such a great story. Well, I think listeners know me, but just in case you are new around here, I am Sarah. I co-host the podcast normally with Megan Francis. Um, I am mom to three kids who are 9, 11, and very soon to be 14. Um, I don't have a teaching background like either of you, but I was an English lit major and have been a professional writer in different capacities. Um, And as my kids have gotten older, finding good books for kids and like playing matchmaker has just been like a really fun side hobby of mine. I spent several years uh, volunteering a lot in our elementary school library. So not only finding books for my own kids, um, but other kids as well is just, it brings me much delight. So that is a little bit about me. Um, Let's keep going and let's meet the readers in our homes right now. So you both mentioned how old your kids are. So that means we span kids from one to almost 14 between the three of us. Let's touch on what types of reading is happening in our homes right now. So we're going to get into specific book titles later. And listeners, every book we mention or resource will be linked in the show notes. Um, But this is like a broad brush overview of the the reading humans in our homes and how we like to read, how they're reading, what types of books are coming in and out of our homes right now. And I can start with this one. Um, My eighth grader and my sixth grader, so my two oldest, read quite a bit for school now. That's That's a big difference from... Um, a few years ago, both fiction and nonfiction, part of their homework or their reports they're working on or a novel study they're doing. So sometimes neither of them has another pleasure read going, which is totally fine. I'm so grateful for the teachers and the librarians um, who are like incorporating these great books into their curriculum. I love seeing what they're bringing home. Um, When they do read for fun, my eighth grader loves time travel fiction and kind of like like YA in like the meet cute type romance genre. Um, the sixth grader loves fantasy and is also like a big nonfiction buff. Uh, both of the older kids have Kindles, but they do read physical books as well. Um, my third grader is by more reluctant reader, that, at least than the first two, which is a little bit of an unfair comparison. But right now she's all in on graphic novels, which is really fun. So she'll just be like disappear for an hour and read, which hasn't been her M.O., Um, All three kids listen to audiobooks, too. We do those in the car or at home. Um, Most of the books coming in and out of our home are physical books from the public library. Or if we're doing e-books and and audiobooks, they're often through the Libby app, which then you can send to your Kindle or do the audiobooks either through Libby or Audible. Um, I got a Kindle for Christmas, and that has really allowed me to read more at night, which has been nice. I I tend toward nonfiction, but I'm always trying to read a little bit more fiction. And then my husband is a reader, but he used to consume most of his books through audiobooks because he used to drive a ton and he doesn't drive at all right now. So he's just in a season where he's not reading much and that's okay. We know how that goes. So that is the Powers House. Joanna, how are how and what are people reading lately in your house? So my kids, my eight year old I feel like this is the year for her that she has really turned into somebody who can read to yeah. somebody who is a reader. Yeah. Um, and that's like, I'm seeing it right now happening. She has always got a book in her hand. She really wanted to take, um, she just got the fantastic beasts and where to find them book for her birthday. And she was like, can I take it to school? But it's like a three minute drive to her school. I was like, <laughs> you don't need to take that with you. Um, she is very into fantasy and graphic novels and for her birthday, her big present was a kid's Kindle Paperwhite. Um, and I mean, every day she is like, can I download this book? Can I download this book? So she is like just plowing through them. Um, my five-year-old is in kindergarten um, and she is definitely in the emerging reader phase. Like she's like recognizing letters, recognizing words. Um, she's not super motivated to start reading on her own yet. Um, her my my middle and my oldest are were both I felt like they became into reading in first grade mm-hmm. um you know there's always the push in kindergarten to really start these skills and start developing this but I feel like naturally they were both way more inclined towards first grade 
Um, and then my three-year-old, um, oh, and my five-year-old also really loves the read to me books on the Epic app. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I never feel guilty no. letting her, letting her do that. Um, and my three-year-old is just, I mean, every picture book, he's been very into the books on tape and CD from the library. And we're finally back at a library story time this spring, which is really nice. Um, and then as far as like me reading to my kids, I am currently personally reading Harry Potter for the first time and I'm reading it to my girls. So we just read through the first illustrated book, which was absolutely beautiful. Yay. Um, for me, I personally like to have a fiction book and a nonfiction book going most of the time. And I have always gravitated towards historical fiction. That's just the genre that I find the most appealing to me. I loved the Dear America series as a kid. And I feel like that really like fostered that love for that genre. Um, but the past two years, I've been kind of dipping my toe into like romance and fantasy. And um, as far as like nonfiction goes, it's like mostly self-helpy kind of books. Yeah. And I typically read my fiction on my Kindle. And then I read my nonfiction in physical form. Um, I think it's just because I'm I'm an underliner and a okay. highlighter. Yeah. And um, but the thing I like about my Kindle um, is I use the Whisper Sync option a lot. So it syncs up your Kindle books to like if you have Kindle and Audi Audible, um, it syncs them up to the same spot. So like if you stop reading in a certain spot, but you want to listen to it later. You can pop it in. I think Brian has used that a little bit, especially when he was doing more audiobooks. It's fascinating. Yeah. And then Eric was not into reading for a while. Um, he just started getting back into making time for reading, and I'm, like, super proud of him. Um, and he is currently reading a sci-fi, I think it's a trilogy um, or a series, and he's reading The Dark Forest by Sitchin Liu. And I have no idea what it's about because well, sci-fi is not my genre. <laughs> well, you and I had a sidebar that we think our husbands would get along. So it will yes. not surprise you that Brian has read that series. And I don't know anything about it either, but I think he oh even re <laughs> I think he reread it. So there you go. Book club. That's awesome. Husband book club. Um, Catherine, tell us about the readers in your home and what people, what everybody's into. Yeah. So I think that my five-year-old is kind of in the same place as Joanna. She's like just starting to recognize some words. She doesn't really um, want to learn to read yet on her own independently. And I don't know if that's just because she's like very attached to us reading together. Um, but we spend a lot of time reading picture books together. She's just kind of starting to get into older chapter books and graphic novels. Um, she's really into princesses and anything involving fairy tales. And my three-year-old, um, she's kind of the boss of the group. So he doesn't always get a ton of say in what we read um and he'll just he's very easygoing so he'll yeah. read along with whatever she's interested in um and then the baby is one so he's just started to not like eat his books yeah. i guess it's an um, important phase yeah so he is really into books with faces um or animals he we have two dogs so anything with a dog in it he loves um, and then when it comes to me, I really love a good fantasy book. Um, and I actually read a lot of YA and I don't know if it's because I spent so much time in middle school or if there's just like something nostalgic about a good YA novel. Um, but I love YA. Uh, and then I read a lot of women's fiction, um, thrillers, and then the same as you guys, like some good self-helpy stuff also. Love it. Yeah. And then my husband actually probably reads more than I do. Um, He's very into uh, nonfiction, though. So like political stuff, financial stuff. He, he also read Dune recently. So he is, uh -huh. you know, also on the sci fi train. He could be in the um, sci fi book club. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we don't have a ton of overlap in our reading taste. My husband and I would not be uh, switching books. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say the same. I would say the same. Well, this was really fun. I think. Um, it's it's always fun to get specific book recommendations, but I wanted to start by painting this broader picture of just like all the reading that's happening in our families. And since you guys have both have younger kids than I do, it's really it's fun to remember those days, the book eating days, the emerging reader days, the reading aloud. So I love all of that. 
Sarah, you know when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming back Dr. Mom Butt Balm as a sponsor today. And Megan, I guess you must be back to changing diapers again, right? Now that you have a step grandbaby in the mix. I have changed a few lately, Sarah. And yeah, it really takes me back to that memory from early motherhood. I actually always enjoyed diaper changes unless they were the really gross toddler ones or if there was diaper rash involved. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember being so stressed out, like gearing up for the saddest diaper change ever. Your baby knows it's going to hurt. You know they're going to cry. It is just the worst. And having to use goopy, gross diaper rash cream definitely didn't help. Dr. Mom Butt Balm was developed by a mom who's also a doctor when she couldn't find any traditional products that worked for her baby's persistent diaper rash. This pediatrician-approved formula is made with all quality ingredients and no artificial dyes or preservatives. And since it's easy to remove, you won't have to wipe and wipe to get it off of your baby's skin. That is so important, especially if they're already a little chafed. And I love the way this formula feels. A little goes a long way. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. All right, we're back. So let's dive into talking about what we as moms are reading these days. Um, You can share what you're in the middle of right now or something you just finished. And it sounds like all of us maybe have a couple books going at once. That's actually new for me, but I do right now. Um, Similar to you, Joanna, I'm kind of doing the Kindle fiction and the um, hard copy nonfiction. So let's just each share where we are with our books. And Catherine, you go first. Yeah, so... um... I just finished two books. Um, The first was The Cartographers by Pang Shepard, which um, I saw all over Bookstagram, which was why I got it. Um, And that was really entertaining. It was really um, different than anything I've read in a long time. Um, And then I just started a great YA series that my friend recommended called The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. That one's also been super fun. And they... um, I really hope they make it into a movie. It's just uh, really fast paced and exciting. Um, And then this past weekend, I started a book called The Ballerinas um, by Rachel Capelkdale. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Um, And I'm only about 30 pages in, but that one's also um, really definitely hooked me. So you mentioned Bookstagram and I have a dumb question. Does that just mean like people who write about books on Instagram? Yes, there's like a whole yeah world of book reviewers on Instagram specifically. Okay. And is it like that hashtag kind of ties it all together or is that just like a general term? I really hadn't heard that term before. Yes. I think it's like a self identifier for people who do that on Instagram, but it's also a hashtag. So if you're looking for book recs on Instagram, you can look up hashtag bookstagram and find some good stuff. I love that. And it will link you to like some fun accounts to follow Mm -hmm. too. If you really like certain book recommendations. So, Joanna, what are you currently reading? I am currently reading the book number five from Bridgerton to Sir Philip with Love, which was definitely inspired by watching the second season. Um, That was kind of like what got me into the romance genre last year. I think I'd always kind of judged that genre of books Uh and then I got very into it. Um, So I'm reading that. And then my nonfiction read right now is Breaking Free from Body Shame by Jess Connolly. And that was a recommendation from a talk I heard about body image and loving your body from my church mom's group. And then I actually just recently finished um, I Must Betray You by Ruta Septis, which I'm going to 
just mispronounce all of these authors' okay. names. Um, but I read that for my book club, and it's actually a YA historical fiction that I would have not picked out for myself. It's set in 1989, Romania, and it's about the Romanian revolution and breaking away from communism. And it's told from a 17 year old's point of view as he is an informer. Wow. And so it was just absolutely fascinating. Wow. Okay. All of those sound really good. Um, okay. So my turn on the Kindle, I just started like two nights ago, uh, broken in the best possible way, which is nonfiction memoir, humor essays by Jenny Lawson, who is a humor writer slash blogger that I've been reading since I first started reading blogs in like 2010. I mean, she was like an OG humor, um, not really a mom blogger because she's always been a humor writer. Um, and now she has several best selling books and they read really fast and are very funny. I was laughing out loud reading on my Kindle last night as we were going to bed. So, um, I always enjoy her books and read them really fast. Um, and then before that on the Kindle, I read The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. Um, again, I'm always really late to like popular fiction. I read things way after other people, but I heard about that one. And I know Kristen Hanna's books are really popular. I loved it. Um, and then in hard copy, I am working my way through Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. I'm so glad I bought the physical copy of that one because... Um, I, I know it's really popular. Probably lots of listeners have seen it, but it it holds almost like a small coffee table book and it's very visual. Um, so it's a it's kind of importantly tactile to read that one in hard copy. So that is where I am right now. So let's talk a little bit about like the how and the when of where when we're doing our reading. So I'm talking about things like we've mentioned Kindles and hard copy, but um, if you have anything else to say about like what format, where you're getting your books from, if you're a library or um, anything else. Um, and then what time of day is it regular and routine or is it all over the place? Are you a fast reader, a slow reader? So let's dig into this a little bit. Joanna, starting with you. Um, I this past school year, I've kind of happened upon this chunk of time that I don't know how much longer it'll last. I don't <laughs> know if it'll be the same next school year because everything always changes. Um, but my girls go to school around seven o'clock in the morning, they get dropped off. And then my three-year-old is a late sleeper. And I don't know why I have Amazing. a late sleep. It's, it's incredible, but I usually have about 30 to 45 minutes, um, between their drop off and his waking up. And so that's when I will usually pick up my nonfiction book because I'm just not as motivated to read nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a huge fan of Laura Tremaine and her podcast. And she has always been a big advocate for reading like 20 minutes of nonfiction in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so I'll like set my timer. And if I get through my 20 minutes of nonfiction, then I'll pick up my fiction book that I really want to read. <laughs> um, and then I, because of the pandemic, I got really into audiobooks. And so if I don't have a podcast kind of in my queue to listen to, then I will switch to my audiobook. Um, and I am a really slow reader. I, it takes me a good bit to get through books. Um, I have a reading goal on my Goodreads, but it, it's definitely, it's hard, it's hard for me to like read fast through something. Cause I think I just want to like chew on it and enjoy it for a while. Um, and then I'm also curious what kind of Kindles y'all have. Cause I have a Kindle Oasis and I know that there are many different types. And, yeah. um, that one is, I think it's relatively new. I've had it for a couple of years, but I think it's like their waterproof version. Oh, that's, I didn't even, I hadn't even heard of that one. I'm, I have the Kindle paper white and I'm okay. relatively new. I got it this Christmas. Okay. So yes. And my two of my older kids also have the paper white and there's just like the, I don't know, the 2018 version and mine's like the 2021 version or something. So. Okay. My husband just revived his Kindle, which was from, I think, 2008. Oh my gosh. Has the physical keyboard on it and everything still. And he was like, no, I don't, I don't need a new Kindle. I have this. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, Catherine, how about you? Um, how and when and idiosyncratically, what's going on with your reading? Yeah. So, um, I find the Kindle discussion so funny. I have, my husband got me a paper white, um, several years ago, I think for Christmas. And I 
I'm sure there's a way to turn this off, but the percentage bar at the bottom that shows you how much of your book you have left, like really stresses me out. <laughs> like sometimes it feels like an insurmountable bar. Um, so that has turned me off to the Kindle. And again, I'm sure I could get rid of it somehow. I can jump in there because I have been very reluctant to go Kindle. And a, a lot of my reluctance has to do with knowing how much I have left in a book, which is yeah. a weird, I, I really like that physically. I like to to know where I am. And I've, I've had the opposite of, um, happen with Kindle where I don't know I'm near the end and it, it just ends. It's almost like cognitively, I, I want to be pacing myself and the Kindle makes that hard. So just validating. I think yes. for me, it has been, it has been more, there's been more wins than losses or more pros than cons to adding it. Um, but I totally get that. Yeah. And you know, there's That's- also just something about like a physical book. I yes. don't know why. Agreed. Um, That's so funny. Cause I find the the um, percentage should be super motivating. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think people have very strong opinions on it either way. I do most of my reading um, after my kids are asleep. So like before I go to bed, um, I definitely stay up uh, way too late uh, just because I love that time <laughs> to myself. Um, I used to listen to a lot of audiobooks. I found that it was easier when my when the one-year-old was younger because I could take him on walks and he would just fall asleep. And it was this like interrupt uninterrupted time that I could listen to audiobooks. But now that he's a little more um, chaotic, I find that I get distracted too easily. So um, I've kind of put audiobooks on hold for a while. Um, but I also do a ton of reading in the car, which I know a lot of people get car sick, but for some reason, um, I'm able to handle it. And we, yeah, we do a lot of driving here in Southern California. So on the weekends, my husband uh, usually drives, which I love, and I get to sit there and read on the freeway. So I get through big chunks of books um, that way. That's, that is really amazing. I, I grew up reading a lot in the car, like on family road trips, and my family would be like, how do you not get car sick? But I think now I would. I think that's a old lady. Yeah, thing. I, I can't. I definitely can't do it in the back seat. Right. I have to be in the passenger seat yeah. for sure. Um, well, I'll just go real quick here because I already mentioned the Kindle. The biggest difference the Kindle has made for me is my ability to read before bed. Um, I didn't really ever used to read at night and I said it was because I was too sleepy, but there's something so easy about the the Kindle that's lit. It's, it is its own light source. So I don't have to have a lamp on. I don't have to reach over and turn off the lamp. So I can read even for five minutes before bed. And I wasn't doing that before. So that's been a great change for me. Um, I also usually read a few minutes in the morning. So I read a little bit in the morning and a little bit at night. I rarely read during the middle of the day and I rarely read for very long, which means I don't, I move pretty slowly through books. I think, I don't think I'm a very slow actual reader. I just don't read very much. If that makes sense. I read a few pages from a couple books, a little bit in the morning, a little bit at night. And so I move relatively slowly through my books because I'm just I'm just picking away at it. I think for me, consistency is key. If I am reading a little bit every day, I'll stick with it. And if I get out of the habit, we all know what that's like. And then you're not reading at all. So, well, let's talk a little bit about how we decide what to read next. Like we've you mentioned Bookstagram, Catherine and Goodreads, Joanna. So I'll go first on this one um, because I I try to have Goodreads. I really like Goodreads as a way to log what I have already read. It's satisfying. And I have done their like yearly book challenges where you set a goal for how many books you want to read. I'm not very good about keeping lists of things I want to read. I forget to go back to them. I love the Girl Next Door podcast uh, for book recommendations because I'm already, it's not a book podcast. They're, they're just, it's a general lifestyle and parenting podcast. Kelsey and Erica read way more than I do, but I think I have a lot of interest overlaps with both of them. Um, so when they mention books, I will often make a note somewhere. Um, but honestly, what I usually do is when I'm getting near the end of a book, I go into my library Libby app and I see what's available for Kindle. Um, and I just borrow or put on hold a bunch of things because I recognize the title. It's like, oh yeah, I've heard people talking about that. Oh yeah. I've heard people talking about that. So it's very, you would think I'd be more organized, but it's very haphazard. And as long as I have something in the queue, I'll give it a try. So that's where I am. How about you, Joanna? I I do use Goodreads for um, tracking my books. And that is where I keep my list of books that I want to read. I don't necessarily use it for book recommendations. And I kind of forget that that's like a part of the mm-hmm. app. Um, I, I find Goodreads to 
be good for logging and tracking. Yeah. But otherwise, I find it to be a very clunky mm-hmm. app to use. Um, the thing that has really directed my book recommendations the past, mm, I guess, seven years is uh, a book club that I'm in. And then I recently started leading another book club. Um, but I find that those discussions that I have there, one, it gave me kind of a rubric of like, you have to read this book to go and talk to yeah. <laughs> people. Yeah. Um, and then, but then the discussions afterwards, I feel like are always rich with, um, book recommendations, but I feel like that was a really good way for me to get back into reading mm-hmm. as a mom was joining a book club. And then I absolutely adore Annie Jones on Instagram. Um, her handle is Annie B Jones 05. And she is like a real life Kathleen Kelly. I followed her for years and she owns a bookstore in Thomasville, Georgia, she and I have like a lot of overlap and in interests and everything. And um, I also just find that talking about books with people, it's a kind of a common ground for like making small talk. Mm-hmm. And when you get past the like, oh, why are you here? Oh, why are you here? And then it's like, what are you reading right now? And then it, you can kind of just get to know somebody better. And then I am also a fan of the Girls Next Door podcast. And I always have my Goodreads up when I'm listening to their book recommendations episodes because I'm like, okay, I'm adding that. I'm adding that. So yeah, that's where I go for inspiration right now. I love that. They're also both Kelsey and Erica are great about sharing what they're reading on the Insta. So even though they are not books to grammars specifically, and that might be why I'm drawn to them is sometimes I think I get a little overwhelmed or feel out of my league by people who are hardcore readers, whereas like just normal people reading good books. That's that's my jam. So, Catherine, you are part of Bookstagram and you are regularly reviewing uh, YA and talking about books. So I'm really excited to hear how you like, how do you decide what's next? You probably feel like you have so many options. Yeah, I think one of the hard things about Bookstagram is that it can be overwhelming because a lot of people are reading You know, sometimes it seems like they're reading a book a day and that can be like, wow, this is a lot of books. Um, But honestly, I um, I get a lot of my book recs recently from a couple of different writing podcasts. Uh, So I've started listening to uh, uh, the title has a curse word in it. And I know there's probably children listening, so I'm going to like, you know, bleep it out. But it's um, the podcast is called The The Blank No One Tells You About Writing. Mm -hmm. And it's hosted by Bianca Marias, I think is how I say her last name. And they do a whole bunch of author interviews and um, they actually read authors queries like like emerging authors and kind of dissect them. And then you get to follow some new emerging authors journeys, which I think is really cool. So I've yeah, I've learned about a lot of great new books uh, from them, one of which was the ballerinas. They did an author interview and they have like a book club and stuff about that book. Um, And then I also listened to Marissa Meyer's podcast, The Happy Writer. And she, if you have teens or tweens, she wrote the Cinder series, which is one of my, when I was a middle school teacher, it was one of my most highly recommended YA series. It's about um, a cyborg, but it's like a retelling of Cinderella in in space. It's great. (laughs) The teens loved it. Um, But she also does a lot of great author interviews. And I just also ordered a book called Hotel Magnifique by Emily Taylor based on the interview that she did with her last week. Um, And I was really drawn to that one because she the author talked about how she wrote it. She was inspired to write it after becoming a mom. Um, It was kind of her like, I don't want to say escape, but her personal time um, that she started writing after having kids to kind of reclaim that part of her self. And I just like really connected to that part of her story. So yeah, I get, I get really invested in authors online, I guess. And that's kind of where I get a lot of my book recommendations. Um, so I also buy a lot of books. Um, I have a really great local bookshop called Bel Canto books near me where I get a lot of them. You can order from them online. And, uh, I know it's, it's a huge privilege to be able to purchase books. Um, but I really like being able to support authors. I think, I think I didn't even know until I started digging into this a little bit more on the internet, how much work it takes to write a book and how little authors get paid for it. Um, and also how important it is 
to pre-order because that is, you know, kind of a financial marker for publishers. Um, and that impacts how much authors get paid. So I really like being able to um, support authors in that way. I love that. And that reminds me, I kind of wanted to um, talk a little bit about bookshop.org, which I don't know if either of you have spent much time on there, but um, this was a, just a happy accident, I guess. I made a personal choice to stop buying books from, you know, the everything store, physical books. No, I'm not talking about Audible and Kindle. It's a little bit different there, but um, I don't know, like two years ago, probably. And around that time, and maybe early pandemic times, I heard about bookshop.org, which is a, an online book retailer. You can order almost any book from there. You won't get it in an hour or one day, um, usually like three to five days. But it supports indie booksellers everywhere. And I, at the time, was living in a place that didn't really have a lot of local bookstores. I, I had that romantic vision of a local bookstore, but I didn't really have one near me. So um, I love bookshop.org. And then, I don't know, six or eight months ago, Megan and I also decided to move away from always recommending Amazon as the source for everything. And, you know, we still have our Prime accounts and we still use it for things. Um, but on the podcast, if we recommend things, we try to spread the love a little bit. And anytime we recommend books, we use bookshop.org. And we do have an affiliate account there, which does mean you can support the podcast a little bit by using those links. But that um, money is also being directed toward local indie booksellers. So that felt uh, for me, bookshop.org felt like it ticked so many boxes of things that were important to me. And Catherine, I'm glad you brought up buying books as a way to support authors. Um, and of course, local libraries and all the things. Um, so listeners in the show notes, as we start to go through a whole bunch of titles, um, you will see links to bookshop.org. That's a little bit more about them. But also we love, love, love when you just go buy books at your local bookstore and use your local libraries. So yeah, I don't know if I could add something yeah, real please. quick, but I, one thing that I didn't know until recently, cause I kind of befriended one of the librarians in my town is that you can recommend books to your librarians yes. that you've read that are new. And she actually really appreciated that. Cause she was like, Oh, this helps us know what to buy. Yes. So if you can't purchase the book on your own, that's another way you can support the author by encouraging your library to buy it for you. Yeah. And authors will tell you that that's really, really helpful. Um, and my li my local public library has a little form. You can do it online. So if you search for a book and they don't have it, it, it pops up like, would you like to recommend this book? And you can just do it online. Um, and I love that you befriended a local librarian. I also have befriended a local librarian since we've moved back to my hometown and it just makes me so happy. So, Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H.com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. All right, we're back. And like I mentioned, we're going to kind of go lightning round style through a bunch of kids book recommendations for ages and stages from baby up through teen. We're going to move pretty quick. Listeners, again, all the links are in the show notes. And I guess it goes without saying that it's not like these are the best books we've ever read for each age range. We're just going to throw out a title that either we're loving right now or that popped top of mind um, for our kids in each ages. So Catherine, you have the baby of this group. So hit us with a baby recommendation. 
Yeah. So the best books that I've gotten for baby babies are from the Love Every subscription box, which if you have like a grandparent who wants to get you a recurring gift, I always recommend that. Agreed. Um, Because they're just pictures. They're real scenes and faces, and they're just about people doing very regular things like making muffins or going on a play date. Um, My friend and I always joke, too, that they're fun for the adults because the people always have like very aspirational kitchens and homes. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like fun to look at their beautiful houses as well. Um, And then if you're not into the subscription, there's one called Making Faces, a first book of emotions, which is like in the same vein. It's just real pictures of baby faces uh, that my, my littlest one has been very, very into. I love it. Okay. Joanna, a toddler book recommendation. So the first thing that came to mind as somebody who has a toddler and somebody who's worked in a preschool where this is like the prime time for the classics, like Eric Carl, Bill Martin, Jr. Um, Sandra Boynton. My toddler is obsessed with Sandra Boynton books right now, especially her, um, dinosaurs, dinosaurs, or oh my oh my dinosaurs one oh. um and then any and all lift the flat books which we have actually gotten a lot of good lift like hardy thick cardboard lift the flat books from usborne books okay. um but yeah i did i couldn't think of any specific titles but this is the time where i am all about the classic kids yeah. books like hungry caterpillar and chicka chicka boom boom i love it Love it so much. Okay, Catherine, moving on up to preschoolers, like say three-year-old age. Yeah, so my three-year-old is really into the Dragon series by Dave Pilkey, which is um, bo- both of the ones I'm going to mention are are ones that I think I read as kids. Uh, and that one's just a really silly, you know, goofy book about Dragon who keeps making mistakes and things like that. But we also are very into Henry and Mudge uh, by Cynthia Ryland. Um, and then anything by Peter Reynolds, we, we are also very, very into. So for him, it has to be a little goofy. Um, and it helps if there's a boy and a dog in it. I love it. I love it. Just a few standards, a few must haves. Um, okay. So we're moving on up and both of you have spoken to that, like emerging reader stage. I'm going to say like kindergarten, first, second grade. And so I want to throw out a few, we'll go back and forth, Joanna, starting with you. But let's move through this early reader um, age and feel free to mention if we're talking about reading to this age or them reading themselves, because I think that can be, um, as we've discussed, readers, that light comes on for readers at very different ages. And so if you talk about Charlotte's Web with a five-year-old, you got to be clear whether you're reading aloud or whether that five-year-old is off to the races already. So um, Joanna, let's start with you and some recommendations for this. I'm going to call it kindergarten through second grade range. So this age range, especially the lower end for me, reminds me of like really beautiful picture books, yeah. um, something that will catch their attention. So I was thinking for authors, I was thinking of Jan Brett, um, mm-hmm. Fancy Nancy yes. and Tommy DePaulo are like, like probably in my top five for mm-hmm. this age range. And um, the one thing I will say, though, is that I like to be cognizant of the font that is being used in these books, because with emerging readers, they're recognizing letters and recognizing sight words. Sometimes, especially with the Fancy Nancy books, there's that that's like the curly Q font Uh and it can be a little confusing. Um, And then recently, two books that we have in our current library stack are um, Moth and Butterfly by Dev Petty, which was really cute and kind of an intro into nonfiction Mm -hmm. um, stuff. and then. Swatch, The Girl Who Loved Color by Julia Denos. Cool. Those both sound good. And Catherine, how about you for this emerging reader stage? Yeah. So the ones that I'm going to recommend are more ones that I would be reading to my daughter. Okay. Um, I think I agree with Joanna on a lot of the ones she recommended, especially if you're kind of letting the kid identify words on their own. Um, and what you said about font is so interesting. I've never thought about that before. So I'm going to keep that in mind when I read now. Um, but so my daughter is going to be entering kindergarten in the fall and she and all of her friends are very into the princess in black series um, by Shannon and Dean Hale. Um, I think there's eight or nine of them and she will just plow through those with me um, because it's got a good combination of, you know, chapter bookie, but still has some pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also recently got uh, a couple books from the Jasmine Taguchi series by Debbie Michiko Florence. And that's the same thing. It's chapter books, but has some really adorable illustrations. 
And she can just, you know, zone out for about a half an hour while I while I read that to her. And those are both very. um, The the characters are super relatable for for kids in like, you know, the five to seven range. I love that. Um, I want to jump in real quick and say that one thing that happened with all three of my kids is the early chapter books like you're describing with Princess in Black where you're reading them aloud to a five, four, five, six year old, because they're short chapters. They still have some illustrations. Um, I can think of so many series like this, like A to Z mysteries and um, anything that would be in your early chapter book section. But then what happens is around second, third grade, depending on the reading level, kids will go back and plow through those independently. So it's almost like they have two rounds of life. The first is as a read aloud for someone who's listening to chapter books for the first time. And then the second is an independent read for a kid who's just getting into chapter books. It may sound obvious, but um, there's so many series that have happened that that way with my kids. And it's been so fun to watch. So, Joanna, let's keep going with this kind of of K through two range for you. Okay, so I'm I'm also going to say my older daughter loved the Princess in Black series. She's more of a tomboy. She loved that it was a princess, but also like a ninja action kind of situation. <laughs> yes. um, that was definitely one of the series that kind of drew her into reading. And then the the gateway series for her and a lot of when a lot of my third graders when I was teaching was the Geronimo Stilton series by Elisabetta Dami. Um, there's so many different sub series to choose from there's like a space version and uh there's one that follows his sister and it's it's really cute um they're not super fun to read aloud but they're really fun for kids to read that's that's just the case with some books yeah 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 um and then we recently got the i think it was from costco we got the question years books by andrea beady um it was if you've read rosie revere engineer or iggy peck architect Mm -hmm. Um, these are the chapter book extensions of them. And so it just kind of has a little bit more of like a mature storyline and set up for um, older kids. I love that. Okay. Well, before we totally depart the younger kids, I want to mention that we have a listener, longtime listener and friend of the podcast named Emma Bland Smith. And Emma's a picture book author um, as her career. She has many published picture books, but she specializes in like picture book nonfiction. I think it's called, um, it's not narrative nonfiction. I always get it wrong, the genre. But this, these picture books read like a story and they are full illustration um, ages, I would say like four to eight. Um, So those, those longer, more like complex picture books, but they're all true stories. A lot of them are about animals or nature. And I just love Emma and her books are gorgeous. She has one about Journey, who was the first wolf that came back down to California when wolves were extinct in California. She has one about the um, alligator at the Science Museum in San Francisco. Who Claude, the albino um, crocodile. Yes. Yeah, I'm like, I'm we, we have up. that book. Okay. So Emma, so you have Claude and um, Odin is about a Labrador or golden retriever who saves goats in the California wildfire. So these are true stories and a lot of them around animals and nature and then told in picture book format. And um, she has a new one that just came out called The Gardener of Alcatraz. And Emma's become a, a good, good friend of the podcast. And her books are everywhere. I mean, legit. She's legit. So I want to mention that because I think nonfiction and picture books don't seem like they would go together. Um, but if you have kids who love science and nature and facts, um, it's such a beautiful blending of those genres. And we will link those up. I'm looking at her Instagram right yes. now and her books are so cute. Yes. I'm just so pretty. Yeah. I, I would give a huge shout out to the the Claude book. Mm-hmm. We got that when we actually visited the the science yeah. museum where Claude lives. Yeah. And my kids are obsessed. Yeah. Violet with Odin is the dog who saves um saves some livestock in the wildfires. It, like it's like her favorite book. So um, it's just so cool that Emma's become become a friend and is a regular listener of this podcast. So Emma, we love you. OK, we are going to move on. And I promise get back to the more lightning round style. I'm going to mention a middle grade series that I never think gets quite enough love. And that is the Clementine books by Sarah Pennypacker, illustrated by Marla Frazzi. And Clementine is the only character that comes close to a Ramona in my experience um, in terms of spunk and a little bit naughty and just delightful, great family relationships, great um, interplay between kids and siblings, great storytelling. 
And this is could be a read aloud or an independent read, but it is where chapter books are leveling up a bit. Um, still, still, I would say that like third, fourth, I think the character herself is in third and fourth grade. Love the Clementine series. So Catherine, how about you for some middle grade fiction? Yeah. So we've been really into, there's, there's two books by Kim Dwinnell. Um, they're called the Surfside Girls series and they are a graphic novel and they're actually the, the woman who wrote them is local to my neighborhood and they're kind of ghost story, but also about these two surfer girls who solve mysteries. Um, And we've been really, really into those. I've been reading them aloud to my daughter, but I could also see like the elementary school age kids really enjoying reading those independently. Um, And then I really like everything Kelly Yang writes. She just came out with um, New From Here, which is about the pandemic. And I didn't read it for a while because I didn't know if I was ready to read about the pandemic, but it was really really great. And I, I kind of feel like that's going to be one of those books that people will teach one day um, about this weird time that we've lived through. I'm so glad you mentioned Kelly Yang. We have only done her books on audiobook and it was an accident, like a happy accidental discovery on, on audiobooks. Um, Front Desk and Three Keys are her first mm-hmm. two and the audiobooks are fantastic. And all the way up through my preteen and teen listening to those. They're so good. So I'm glad yeah. you mentioned her. Um, Joanna, how about a middle grade novel for you? I actually just finished, uh, this book, a place to hang the moon. And it is a world war II historical fiction. I read it for my book club. Um, I think it would constitute as middle grade if you're reading it on your own, Mm -hmm. but I am personally going to read it aloud to my girls probably this summer. Um, just, it follows three siblings that are, um, relocated to the English countryside. And they're also like looking for a family because they're orphans. And it's just, it's just a really beautiful book about sibling dynamics and chosen family. Um, But that is really the only one I have right now. I am not a huge YA or middle grade reader on my own. Um, But I am loving all of Catherine's recommendations because my Goodreads list is growing. (laughs) Yeah. And you'll, and your kids will get into these ages and then they'll be bringing books home from the library or reading them in class. And Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the nice thing is we don't have to know all the things for our kids. So, um, well, moving right up into YA, um, this is a series that was new to me. Um, and I have not read it, but my 13 year old did. And it's the wayward children series by Sean and McGuire. Catherine, I'll be curious if this is like, oh, yeah, duh, super obvious to you. Yeah, p- people love this one. OK, all right. Um, so, again, I, like I was not big into YA and my 13 year old is a little sensitive to like really dark stuff like murder or uh, too much suspense. Um, and some YA can get real dark. Um, but this one, the, the books are rather short, which uh, was appreciated. And the first in the series is called Every Heart a Doorway. And then we were excited to see that there are like seven more. So we just put them on reserve at the library. And Catherine, how about you? This is your this is your sweet spot. Why? Yeah. So I have so many, but I'm not going <laughs> to list all of them. So I mentioned the inheritance games before, which if you grew up reading the Westing game, which I think a lot of us probably read in elementary school, it's kind of like that, but modernized. And then Um, I recently read a bunch of really great YA romance. I think kind of, Sarah, what you're saying, your kids might be into. So Eleven Paper Hearts was a great one. Um, It's by Kelsey Hartwell. And it's um, a girl is in a car accident, can't remember a certain period of her life. And then she gets these Valentine's clues on hearts that, you know, you can probably kind of see where that's going, that she's forgotten something important and adorable. Um, And then there's another great one called Tweet Cute um, by Emma Lord that um, is about a Twitter meet cute. And I just loved it and recommend it to adults and teens alike. (laughs) I am pretty sure that my teen read that one. That one sounds familiar. And that is, you're right. That is totally the genre that I'm talking about. I want to mention one more. And then if you guys have any anything in this more like all family or nonfiction section that comes to mind, feel free to shout it out. But um, my whole family loves nonfiction. Like we're, we're kind of nerdy. We love to learn and we love books that present information in clever and creative ways. So we went to the library over spring break. We went to the, the downtown library, the bigger one, um, not just my little tiny local branch. And this book caught my eye. 
And it's called Brilliant Maps for Curious Minds, 100 New Ways to See the World by Ian Wright. And it's pictorial, um, really like modern design, bright color, eye-catching world maps that show you different random facts. Some of them very silly. Like I'll give an example. One was like the number of punk bands per 100,000 people as represented on a colorful map. And so you're seeing the countries where there's a higher prevalence of punk bands per 100,000 people. And then there are other ones of like countries where the economy is larger than the state of California's economy. And you're looking at, so you're looking at all of these interesting facts, but presented pictorially on a map. And like all five of us, ages nine to 44, were into this book. So I guess it's a vote for, first of all, browsing your local bookstore or your local library and not forgetting about nonfiction as a way to start conversations as a family. Um, I don't think nonfiction has to be like biography or like science glossary. I think sometimes we have a narrow definition of nonfiction. And man, the publishers and the authors these days are putting out really cool nonfiction books for the whole family. So yeah, that's, that's where I wanted to leave this. Can I add one to that category? So there's one that we read constantly in my house called The Great Stink. And it's about the man who redesigned London's sewer system so that there wasn't a bunch of poop in the water. And if you have, you know, elementary school and preschool kids, I feel like they love talking about um, bodily functions and science. So that's been a really fascinating one for us. I love that. I also have one that we recently got from the library and I got it for my son because he wanted a dinosaur book and it had some cute little cartoon drawings. Um, but then my eight year old just devoured it. She thought it was so cool. Um, and it's, it's by Ken Jennings, the guy who won Jeopardy. Um, and it's one of his junior genius guides and it's about, it's just called dinosaurs. Um, but it had, it was, it was, it was written kind of like journal style. Mm -hmm. And so there were like little cartoon drawings and little notes off to the side. And it was just really cool to to see what we both enjoyed it. So I love that. And I want to say two more things. One, those types of books make great gifts. So like Easter baskets, birthdays, Christmas. Um, I feel like for a long time, any kind of large hardcover nonfiction, the ones made by DK or National Geographic, um, always made great gifts. And then over time, we have a huge collection, which brings me to my second tip, which is we've always had a nonfiction like shelf in our, no matter what kind of house we live in or like how disorganized and spread all over the house, the books are, we always have almost like a reference section that's filled with those encyclopedias and those, um, the, the types of books we're talking about. And I swear kids will just go over and pull off like a, like a Guinness book of world records or a dinosaur encyclopedia and look through it. So that's brought me so much joy over the years. And I think it's fun for reluctant readers as well. A lot of times those have a lot of pictures and facts and things that maybe draw a kid's attention who isn't into traditional chapter books. Well, this was so fun. Thank you both so much for being here today. Let's um, make sure everybody knows where to find you both on the internet so that they can follow you, find you on the bookstagram, Catherine, and get to know you. So Joanna, where can everybody find you online? I am mostly on Instagram. Um, You can find me at Cafe Du Martin. I do have a very neglected blog if you want to look at that, (laughs) which is at cafedumartin.com. But um, it is not updated regularly. I am very much on Instagram. And you're writing at the momhour.com and Dallas yes. moms as well. So you're, you're, you are blogging out in the world. Um, yeah. and Catherine, how about you? Yeah. So same. I'm mostly on Instagram. You can find me at the paper dart. And I also have a blog that I don't think I've posted on in several months, but that's the paper dart.com. And, um, one day I'll get back to that. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for spending this time talking about books and listeners. Those show notes are going to be a big, long list. We'll keep it organized for you. Make sure all those links are going to bookshop.org. And we hope you'll also check your local bookstore and use your local public library. Joanna and Catherine, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Hi, everyone. Megan here. Sarah and I would absolutely love it if you would hit pause right now, like right where you're listening and leave the mom hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, this is one of the biggest ways you can thank us. And it really only takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening to Apple podcasts, you can navigate to the mom hours show listing. So when you're in the episode you're listening to right now, click where it says the mom hour just above the play button and then scroll all the way to the bottom and you will see the ratings and reviews. We would love if you would leave us one as well. Thank you so much for listening. 
The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%.